At Granger, we're for the ones who specialize in saving the day and for the ones who've mastered the art of keeping business moving. We offer industrial grade supplies for every industry with same day pickup and next day delivery on most orders, all backed by real people ready to help so you can get the right answers and products right when you need them. Call, clickgranger.com or just stop by. Granger for the ones who get it done. Shop the Plato's Closet Black Friday event in North Charleston and West Ashley and let the deals begin. You know Plato's Closet always has a huge selection of trendy recycled styles at amazing prices, but Black Friday deals are different. They're better. We've been holding back some of our best inventory and you won't want to miss our Black Friday event. Save on gently used styles from Patagonia, Lululemon, Lily Pulitzer, and hundreds of popular brands. Plato's Closet is ready to let the Black Friday deals begin. Plato's Closet, located in West Ashley on Sam Rittenberg Boulevard and North Charleston on Rivers Avenue. This is Space Time, Series 26, Episode 91, for broadcast on the 31st of July, 2023. Coming up on Space Time. Could ancient asteroid impacts have fueled volcanism on Venus? A new date for the start of plate tectonics on planet Earth? And NASA's Juno spacecraft undertakes its latest and closest flyby yet of the volcanic Jovian moon Io. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. A new study claims the early impact history of Venus might explain how Earth's sister planet has maintained its youthful surface despite lacking plate tectonics. The findings, reported in the journal Nature Astronomy, compared the early collision histories of the two planets and concluded that Venus likely experienced higher speed, higher energy asteroid impacts. The authors say these would have created a superheated core that promoted extended volcanism and resurfaced the planet with floods of magma. The study's lead author, Simone Marchi from the Southwest Research Institute in Boulder, Colorado, says one of the mysteries of the inner solar system is that despite their similar size and bulk density, Earth and Venus are distinctly different planets, especially when it comes to the processes that move materials through each planet. And the whole thing's really funny because, let's face it, both planets were made at the same time, in the same part of the solar system, out of the same materials, and yet they've gone on to very different destinies. Earth's shifting plate tectonics continually reshapes its surface as chunks of the crust collide to form mountain ranges and in places promote volcanism, while other parts subduct under the continents while new material breaks the surface at mid-ocean ridges. On the other hand, Venus is no evidence of any type of plate tectonic activity, but it has more volcanoes than any other planet in the solar system. In fact, there are over 80,000 Venusian volcanoes at last count. That's 60 times more than the Earth. And they've played a major role in renewing Venus's surface through floods of lava, which appear to be continuing right up to this day. Previous simulations have struggled to create scenarios which support this level of volcanism. However, new computer modelling suggests that long-lived volcanism driven by early energetic collisions on Venus does offer a compelling explanation for its young surface age. The massive volcanic activity is fueled by a superheated core, resulting in vigorous internal melting. While Venus and Earth may have formed in the same neighbourhood, slight differences in the two planets' distances from the Sun may have had a major effect changing the impact velocities of asteroids and comets which hit the planets. Now These differences arise because Venus is closer to the Sun and moves faster around it, thereby energising impact conditions. In addition, the tail of collisional growth is typically dominated by impactors originating well beyond Earth's orbit, and that requires higher orbital eccentricities to collide with Venus rather than the Earth, and that results in far more powerful impacts. It's a simple equation. Higher impact velocities melt more material, melting as much as 82% of Venus's mantle. And this, the authors say, produces a mixed mantle of molten materials redistributed globally and a superheated core. 
If impacts on Venus had significantly higher velocities than on Earth, a few large impacts could have drastically different outcomes, with important implications for the subsequent geophysical evolution. The multidisciplinary team involved in the research combined expertise in large-scale collision modelling and geodynamic processes to assess the consequences of these collisions for the long-term evolution of Venus. Venus's internal conditions aren't well known, and before considering the role of energetic impacts, geodynamical models required special conditions in order to achieve the sort of massive volcanism we see on Venus. But the authors found that once you input high-energy impact scenarios into the model, it easily comes up with the extensive and extended volcanism without needing to tweak the parameters. The new findings come in the wake of NASA's decision to undertake two new missions to Venus, Veritas and Da Vinci, and the European Space Agency isn't left out either. They're planning a new mission to Venus called Envision. We'll keep you informed. This is Space Time. Still to come, a new date for the start of plate tectonics on the Earth, and Juno undertakes its closest flyby yet of the volcanic Jovian moon Io. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Well, it seems the ongoing debate about when plate tectonics began on planet Earth is continuing, with new evidence suggesting subduction commenced around 3.2 billion years ago. The findings are important because Earth's the only planet known in our solar system to have significant plate tectonics, and perhaps not coincidentally, the only planet capable of hosting life. The findings, reported in the journal Earth Science Reviews today, follows the establishment of a new framework for dating Earth's evolution, including the formation of the continents and of mineral deposits. The researchers studied Australia's abundant lead and zinc ore deposits, along with a vast global database of geology. They determined that 3.2 billion years ago was a crucial point in Earth's history, when the planet changed from what was essentially a layer cake structure to a mode of remixing, possibly driven by the start of global-scale plate tectonics, a process which still dominates the Earth system today. The study's lead author Luke Desset from Curtin University says one of the main questions to be answered was when continents as we know them today were first formed. Now, to get an answer, the authors had to first determine when the composition of the continental crust began to differ significantly from the Earth's mantle, where the continental material was extracted from. The challenge was to first understand how the Earth's mantle evolved since the Great Moon Formation impact 4.5 billion years ago. That's when a Mars-sized planet, which scientists have called Thea, collided with the early proto-Earth, turning both bodies into a single molten magma ocean with some ejector then flung into orbit to form the moon. Meanwhile, the magma ocean restarted the entire differentiation process, which would eventually form an inner and outer core, surrounded by a thick mantle and a thin crust. Desset says scientists first need to reconcile this well-established theory with the composition of the present-day mantle. The authors use lead isotope compositions from rock samples from different parts of the Earth's surface, as well as from ancient meteorites dating back to the formation of the solar system 4.6 billion years ago. This allowed them to reconstruct an interpretation of the Earth's mantle evolution. They could then compare Earth's mantle evolution with that of the Australian continent by using measurements from large lead zinc deposits known for tracking continental crust deposition through time. Australia has an estimated 52 billion tonnes of lead zinc ore, making it the second largest reserve in the world just behind China. They range from as old as 3.4 billion years in Western Australia's Pilbara region down to relatively young deposits just 285 million years old, and that makes them perfect for study. The team's analysis revealed that the lead zinc deposits started to exhibit significant differences from the Earth's mantle around 3.2 billion years ago. 
and Dissette says it's this period which is considered to be the point at which plate tectonics began to be the dominant driver of continental formation on the planet. This is a huge debate in the community, and if you look at the recent papers, so basically, as you said, some people think it starts just right away after Earth formed and the Moon is formed, and then there's a paper saying that it can start very, very late, like at the geological uh, time scale, like 500 million years or, uh, ago, so yeah, very recently. So there's a huge gap when we don't know where, where it starts. So basically, the idea is to try to find a way to quantify or find a, a proxy of when you think plate tectonic starts, which is a vast question, right? So in our case, um, what, we, what we thought is when you have plate tectonics, what we know is to have plate tectonics, you, have, you need to have like continental plates. So you need to form the continent and then you need to continent to evolve and to become very different from the from the mantle where they have been when they have been extracted. So to form the continental crust, you need you, you have this like the, the the planet is formed, then you have the core, and then you have this layer of rocks we call the, the mantle. And then you need to melt the mantle, and then you produce the continental crust, and then you need the crust to stay where it is, like to float on the mantle. To float above yes. the basalt underneath. Yeah. Yes. The thing is, we think that in the beginning, we have evidence that in the beginning of the Earth's history, you, you can produce the continental crust. So we have evidence like in the Jackie of Zircons, where we know there is like continental crust material formed very early on. The question we don't know is, is, is this rock going back to the mantle already? So then you go back in, in, in where you started and you just remixed and then you extract and remix. The thing we need to have the crust that's been formed and then stay where it is. So to do that, we, we need to find some proxies, some evidence that the, the mantle and the, and the crust become they're very different in terms of composition. And this is, this is what we, we try to, to do in, in this paper. And how did you go about doing that? Basically, we are using lead isotopes. So lead contains different isotopes, so different um, different type of, of lead. We have lead deposits that form throughout Earth's history. And we, we just measure the composition of, of, of this lead on these uh, deposits because they reflect the composition of the crust. The problem we had is we need evolution of the mantle as well. So this is what we started to study how to know the lead composition of the mantle. So to do that, we started from today, when you go on the ocean, you have the ocean crust, and your ocean crust is extracted from the mantle as well. And we know this, this isotopic composition. So then we make a model to see how the later isotopic composition of the mantle evolved since the formation of the Earth. So we had to use the present day composition of the mantle, but we have to, to model how the later isotopic composition of the Earth was at the beginning. And for, to do that, we had to understand how the giant impact moon formation uh, processes, uh, um, you know, modify that because lead is an element that go to the rocks, but also go to uh, the, um, the surface and, and, and basically go, can go to the, to the, to the core when you form the core. So we have to understand all these processes to basically to connecting these two points which is the um, present day composition of the mantle and the composition of the mantle back in the day, you know, when, when this mantle formed right at the beginning, right? So th- we, we define this model and then we just compare this, this evolution of the, of the mantle with the composition of the continental crust, measuring isotopic composition within the, um, the lead deposits. And then we find that there is, uh, at the beginning, so from or around 3. like. 4 billion years old and 3.8 billion years old until 3.2, they were the same composition. The metal and the crust is the same. But after that, you see a, a difference. You see that the, the continental crust is beginning to be more uh, different. And this difference is then is, is significant after 3.2 until today. So that's what we say. Okay, we have the formation of the continental crust at the time. And then it has to and become more and more different with time. So then we say, oh, so then this is at the time where we should have a... Uh, what we call something like modern-like plate tectonics formation starting at the time. That's all complicated, however, by thinking yes. like, well, especially in WA, where you've got this huge U-shaped craton under that part yes. of the, the crust, which goes down many kilometres into the mantle, got one bit popping up in the southwest of Western Australia and the other bit popping up in the Pilbara region. You've got that as a problem. You've also got the fact that in somewhere like Canada, you've got other dates using zircon as a dating technique technique when the continental crust is like it all formed. Yes, yes, it's a very tough job. So but the, the, the thing that it's, I would say, original in our research is usually um, th- we, we know very little on how the mantle evolved, right? And we have those continental crust uh, reliefs, you know, like in the Pilbara, in the Yilgan, in Canada, in, in Russia, uh, in the United States, Southern America, pretty much everywhere, right? But the thing is, when, when you look at these, these reliefs, you mostly have reliefs of the crust. 
And as I said, so you can form the crust very early on. You don't know if this crust, so we have some bits of crust, but you don't know how much crust has been formed at the time. Because if you go to the, the Jack Hills in the northern Yilgarn, yeah. you, you say, oh, we have rocks that we can find 4.4 billion, you know, small grains. But are those grains representative of like huge continents or just small bits of continental crust, right? So what is original is research. So we compare what we know about the crust, but also what we know about the mantle. And this is really like this crust mantle relationship that's really critical to see what happened. This is where we try to do, we, we, we manage to find this kind of a difference between the mantle and the crust, which which is by until now was quite obscure. So that, that's also the, something we pretty like in this work is we, we would be able to connect the mantle and the crust and we find this 3.2 billion years old time where we think it, it, there is extraction. And what is interesting is we are not the, the only one saying 3.2 was a tipping point. For example, there is a paper published in Nature, very, I think maybe this week or something, using another isotopic system, so titanium isotopes, which is a bit novel novel tool uh, people are using and they are finding pretty much the same in the same time frame so they say after 3.5 ish to 3.2 we have a major change in isotopic composition between the crust and the mantle so this is quite interesting to see that this time period is is becoming more and more um, important in our understanding how 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 plate tectonics and cosmic crust formed so uh, there is a line of evidence saying that this time is might be the tipping point we've got planet earth forming 4.6 billion years ago and, yes. and then about uh 4.5 billion years ago, Thea, a Mars-sized body, slammed into this yes. proto-Earth. And, yes. and all the differentiation that had taken place up until then, that was all wiped out. The whole thing became one huge molten magma ocean again. And then yes. the differentiation process recommenced at 4.5 billion years. Yes. Heavy elements heading towards the centre, lighter elements heading towards the surface. And then yes. as it cooled, as it slowly cooled and solidified, we have lots of radioactive elements in there and lots of heat inside the planet, and that then starts this conveyor belt of plate tectonics, which is still going yes. on today. The, 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 the key word is cooling. I think, yeah, right at the beginning, the, the mantle was so dynamic that everything that got up, maybe some piece would, would stay there, like in the, in the Pilbara or, you know, very small pieces, but the majority would go down. And at some point, because the Earth is cooling, then the, 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 the convection in the mantle became, like, less dynamic and then it, it allowed the, the crust to stay there and then to start to evolve to the crust we know today. Now you've got samples from what one location? So basically for, for in, in our research so we use the database for um, for the crust. We use the database from um, the Geoscience, of, Geoscience Australia because Australia it's really cool because there is lead deposits from 3.8 to no 3.6 sorry to, to today right and uh, Australia the Geological Survey in Australia the Commonwealth Geological Survey, but also all the states doing a very good job of, you know, uh, documenting all the mineral deposits and getting all the geochemical data. So we have like huge database and this, so we, we use all this wealth of data to constrain what's going on for the crust evolution. So that, that's what we did for the crust. And for the mantle, what we did, so we used the online databases where we have a huge amount of data for, for entire, entire Earth history, for the mantle, mantle uh, derived rock. So we, we have a comprehensive database of basically the entire health history and for both the crest and the mantle uh, recall. So that's, that's what we did. That's Luke Doucette from Curtin University. And this is Space Time. Still to come, NASA's Juno spacecraft undertakes its closest flyby yet of the volcanic Jovi moon Io. And later in the science report, a preliminary analysis by the World Meteorological Organization suggests that July 2023 will be listed as the hottest month on record for planet Earth. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Wells Fargo presents one of the surest ways to grow your money. A Wells Fargo CD account, where you can earn a 5.00% annual percentage yield on an 11-month term with a minimum opening deposit of $5,000. Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com backslash CD rates to open a CD account and start growing your savings with us. Wells Fargo Bank, N.A., member FDIC. Hello, Saver. 
Whether you're saving for that trip to the tropics or saving for an emergency, now is the time to take advantage of Wells Fargo's savings options. Wells Fargo offers savings accounts that can help you save towards your goals. So, what are you saving for? Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com backslash save to open a savings account today. Wells Fargo Bank, N.A., member FDIC. NASA's Juno spacecraft has just completed its latest flyby of the spectacular volcanic Jovian moon Io. The spacecraft made its closest approach yet to the fiery world, coming within 22,000 kilometres of its lava-covered surface. The data collected by Juno's Jovian infrared aural mapper and other science instruments will provide a wealth of information on the hundreds of erupting volcanoes pouring out molten magma and sulfurous gases over the surface of the volcano Festoon Moon. Juno Principal Investigator Scott Bolton from the Southwest Research Institute in San Antonio, Texas, says while the auroral mapper was actually designed to study Jupiter's polar aurora, its ability to identify heat sources is proving indispensable in the hunt for active volcanoes on Io. He says as Juno gets closer with each flyby, the mapper and other science instruments all add to science's library of data on the moon, allowing researchers to not only better resolve surface features, but to understand how they change over time. Launched back in 2011, Juno's been studying the Jovian system since 2016 and has just commenced the third year of its extended mission. In Roman mythology, which of course is rooted from Greek mythology, Juno was the uh, wife and sister uh, goddess of Jupiter. And Jupiter was sort of being naughty with some friends, so he cast a veil of clouds around himself and his friends. But of course, Juno was a fairly powerful god herself and used her powers to look right through the clouds and see the true nature of Jupiter and understand what he was really up to. And that's exactly what the Juno spacecraft does for us, is that it goes there with special instruments in a special orbit and uses its powers to see right through Jupiter's clouds and understand its true nature, which is holding these secrets for us about how the solar system formed and where we all came from. Juno spins like a propeller, uh, where the propeller's kind of facing the sun because they're all solar powered. If you spin something, it stays spinning. It's like a gyroscope. We can use a spinning spacecraft to let each instrument get its turn to see Jupiter. We get to go very close to the planet, inside the radiation belts instead of outside the radiation belt. We're in a polar orbit, so by small adjustments of the timing, we can map the entire planet. We can get repeated stripes at different longitudes as Jupiter spins underneath us. It does mean that Juno is see the polar regions to a greater extent than with other spacecraft, but I think the most important thing is that it gets in very close to the planet as part of that ellipse, brings it in a few thousand miles above those cloud tops, very close, near the equator. We go over the poles of Jupiter, that means we can study the magnetosphere in a different way. A magnetosphere is the sphere of influence of a magnetic field. So a planet that has a magnetic field has a magnetosphere when its sphere of influence extends beyond the planet out into space and affects the region around it. The magnetosphere of Jupiter is vast. So if you think of Jupiter being 10 times the size of the Earth and the magnetosphere is 100 times the size of Jupiter. I would expect you to know to tell us more about how planets work, meaning how the heat gets out, what kinds of flows exist inside the body, how magnetic fields get generated, learning what Jupiter is made of, we will learn such a wide range of things. For indeed, Jupiter is the most massive planet in the solar system. It is the body you want to understand in order to understand the architecture of everything else, including Earth. Slightly larger than the Earth's moon, Io is a world in constant torment. Not only is Jupiter the biggest planet in our solar system forever pulling on it gravitationally, but so too are Io's Galilean siblings, the ice world of Europa, and the biggest moon in the solar system, Ganymede. The result is that Io is constantly being stretched and squeezed, generating lots of internal friction in the process. 
That friction is superheating the moon's internal structure, and that's resulted in a volcanic cauldron, with dozens of volcanoes constantly erupting over its surface. During Juno's last flyby of Io back in May, the JunoCam imager took a picture from 35,600 kilometres, showing a smudge at the moon's Volund region near the equator. Now, these smudges are often smoking guns to planetary scientists. Jason Perry from the University of Arizona's High Rise Operations Center in Tucson says that when he compared it to visible light images taken of the same area during the Galileo mission and the New Horizon flyby in 1999 and 2007, he was excited to see changes where the lava flow field had expanded to the west and another volcano just north of Valund had fresh lava flows surrounding it. During the same May 16th pass, Juno's Jovian Infrared Aurora Mapper found a smoking gun of its own, capturing the 202-kilometre-wide Loki Patera, the largest volcanic depression on Io, appearing to be active. The observations showed that lava could be bubbling onto the surface of the area in the northwest, in the process creating a lava lake to the south and east. It's a fascinating observation, and one of many yet to come, thanks to NASA's Juno spacecraft. This is Space Time. Wells Fargo presents one of the surest ways to grow your money. A Wells Fargo CD account where you can earn a 5.00% annual percentage yield on an 11-month term with a minimum opening deposit of $5,000. Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com backslash CD rates to open a CD account and start growing your savings with us. Wells Fargo Bank N.A. Member FDIC. Wells Fargo presents one of the surest ways to grow your money. A Wells Fargo CD account where you can earn a 5.00% annual percentage yield on an 11-month term with a minimum opening deposit of $5,000. Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com backslash CD rates to open a CD account and start growing your savings with us. Wells Fargo Bank, N.A., member FDIC. And time now to take a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. A preliminary analysis suggests that July 2023 will be listed as the hottest month on record for the planet, largely because of global warming. The World Meteorological Organization, the European Union-funded Copernicus Climate Change Service and Leipzig University have combined temperature data for July, finding that it will be the hottest July on record by a wide margin. July 2023 will be 0.2 degrees Celsius warmer than the previous warmest July, which was back in 2019, and it follows on from the planet's hottest June on record. And the addition of an El Nino event which began back in May will further boost global temperatures. As a result of this climate pattern's combination with climate change makes it highly likely that more months this year will also set new temperature records. But the authors say that July 2023 won't just be the hottest month since records began, but it's also likely to be the hottest month in 120,000 years. They base that claim on evidence of past temperatures found in ancient sediments and layers of ice, as well as in other paleoclimate records. The World Meteorological Organization says these temperatures are related to heat waves in large parts of North America, Asia and Europe, which, along with wildfires in countries including Canada and Greece, have had major impacts on people's health, the environment and national economies. On July the 6th, the daily average global surface temperature on planet Earth surpassed the record set in August 2016, making it the hottest day on record, with July the 5th and July the 7th only just behind. Meanwhile, there are now growing fears that the Gulf Stream could collapse by 2050 because of climate change. 
A report in the journal Nature Communications claims that contrary to recent IPCC assessments, Danish researchers say the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, that's the large system of ocean currents that carries warm water from the tropics to the North Atlantic, could collapse any time after 2025 under current rates of greenhouse gas emissions. The team have analysed sea surface temperatures in the North Atlantic between 1870 and 2020 in order to get a proxy for the Gulf Stream, finding early warning signals of a big change in the system, which might suggest it could shut down as early as 2025 and certainly no later than 2095. They say that the last time this kind of abrupt climate change happened, it led to average northern hemisphere temperatures fluctuating by 10 to 15 degrees Celsius over a decade. A reanalysis of Australian clinical trial data has shown that healthy people over the age of 70 shouldn't take a daily low-dose aspirin as it could significantly increase the risk of brain bleeds with no reduction in the risk of a stroke. The findings, reported in the Journal of the American Medical Association, are a reanalysis of the Australian-led ASPRI study and extends the trial's findings by focusing on stroke and bleeding events. The authors say the study supports recent recommendations that low-dose aspirin should not be prescribed for primary prevention in healthy older adults. Reports of glasses of beer falling, skidding, sliding or being pushed off a table or bar by some invisible unknown force, in other words a ghost, are pretty common in the paranormal world and the events described are certainly real. However, while a paranormal explanation may be thrilling, Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics points out the world of science offers a far more rational explanation. Right. Now, you may be surprised to know that at uh, Skeptic Central... We get sent videos of ghosts and strange paranormal phenomena all the time, like every day. And often they happen in pubs, which is interesting because they have spirits there, of course. Uh Ah. Pubs also have CCTV within the pub for good reasons. And you'll see these little videos of people sitting in the pub drinking and then off on on a sideboard somewhere around the bar, suddenly this glass will seem to move and fall off the side and smash, etc. And people instantly say, of course, ghosts, poltergeists are moving the glasses around. And it's interesting and it's fun and you wonder what the CCTV is doing looking at the wrong part of the pub, but never mind. There are explanations for it. It does happen, but there are explanations for it which are quite sort of mundane. And one is basically the glasses capturing air under the bottom. Now, if you look at most glasses, they will have a on, on the bottom, on the, the base of the glass, there's a rim and there's a little sort of indentation underneath. And if you catch, if you... Um, you put the glass down, often not a full glass. It doesn't have to be a full glass. It's a bit harder to move. But an empty glass or almost empty glass, you put it down on the surface of the bar and you're presuming you're not having a mat or something on the bar, but it's a straight sort of polished surface and the it's air gets captured. It's a really smooth bar top, doesn't it? A really smooth bar top. It can be wet. wooden ones. No, not the ones you slide down to the, to the person at the end of the bar. Yeah. Yeah, it has to be smooth. It has to be very smooth. If there's sunlight on the glass, it'll actually make the air, ex- the air that's underneath, that's trapped underneath the glass, explode. Expand, right? If the surface of the bar is warm, what happens is that the air expands and therefore creates a little bubble underneath the glass, which is easier to move, to slide of its own accord, yep. right? And if there's an uneven surface or if there's a push or if who knows what, it might just move a bit. And if it happens to be beside the edge of the bar, it'll possibly fall off. It's not going to move a huge amount. It's not going to move from one end of the bar to the other, but they do move. And if you catch it on CCTV... It looks um, really cool and like a... Like a ghost. It looks impressive. It's, it's, it's quite fun. It. it must have been a ghost. It yeah. must have been a ghost, yeah, because I, I can't explain it. It's the old story. I can't explain it, therefore it must be a ghost, which means I just explained it. There's a, there's a similar phenomenon called the Leiden frost effect. When there's a heat underneath your sweat, you form a liquid, say, under your foot when fire walking, if you ever try that. Have no, you tried that? No, I have tried it. Uh, yes, yes, I know you have. Uh, <laughs> and it, it hurt. Um, but uh, it, you, there's a, you, a layer. you don't stop. The idea is to keep going. You cannot stop, and you have to make sure that the coals are actually sort of settled down to just blowing. But it forms a liquid. This is a suggestion that it forms a liquid under your feet, which is sweat or vapor or whatever, and then that will act as a little barrier for a short time, right? Don't stand on the coals. It's not going to work. But if you move very quickly across the coal surface, and don't t- don't try this at home, um, that it, it might give you sort of very, very, very short-term protection against being burnt. No guarantees. It doesn't always work. And it's a similar thing, therefore. It's a layer of air or liquid that is sort of acting as a buffer against gravity 
or against yes. friction. It acts as a buffer against friction, and therefore the things can move a bit, right, off their own accord. And therefore, in a video, it looks good, but don't take it as evidence of being haunted. That's Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics. That's the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcast, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favourite podcast download provider and from spacetimewithstuartgary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Space Time store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Space Time patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.com for full details. And if you want more space time, please check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, through our Spacetime YouTube channel. And on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. And Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. Wells Fargo presents one of the surest ways to grow your money a Wells Fargo CD account where you can earn a 5.00% annual percentage yield on an 11-month term with a minimum opening deposit of $5,000. Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com backslash CD rates to open a CD account and start growing your savings with us. Wells Fargo Bank, N.A., member FDIC.